Hi, it's Jessie Dujari again. Welcome back to another episode of Tales from the Path. I'm so excited to be back with you guys. We are here with somebody I have been listening to for a long time since I first started to awaken and understand what channeling is. And I'm super excited to talk to him. <laughs> I'm kind of one of those fans that just stays quiet in the background. So I'll try not to gush. <laughs> so today we've got Rob who's here with us. Hi. <laughs> Hello. It's so, it's so wonderful to be here with you today and, and all your viewers, listeners. Uh, it's an amazing experience to be able to co-create this experience, the experience with you, and, and to know that some of the work we've done has helped you on your path that makes me blush. <laughs> so I'm happy and proud to be here. Thank you. Well, honestly, what uh, the very first thing I heard with you was um, your work with Metatron, channeling Metatron, because my first real introduction into energy work, as far as when I started training about three years ago, was um, was understanding my own connection to angelic energies and what it is to be, um, you know, a, an incarnated piece of that angelic consciousness and, and awakening into that. So it was like, oh, that's so great. There's other people. I'm not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's something that I just recently started playing with. That Metatron's energy made itself known to me last year and, and this mm -hmm. year it's become more relevant, but I have noticed ever since starting down that path, it's amazing how many people have just bumped into me because of that work and then they fell on to the other work. And the work I've been doing with the extraterrestrial energies has been much, much longer uh, than yeah. Metatron. So I didn't connect with your extraterrestrial work when I first saw you because I had a lot of fear blockages in place about extraterrestrial connections due to my childhood experiences. And, um, and so that was my very first exposure to you, and, I, and that was so awesome. And when you started channeling Metatron, somebody messaged me about you, and I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that guy. But then I started listening to that stuff, and I was like, oh. That's a little different than what I hear because I connect to Gabriel and it's a different kind of energy. Uh, but it was it, hearing the voice, hearing the logic pattern, the thought pattern, the processes, the approach made all of it make so much more sense to me. I didn't realize it was only a year ago that you started channeling that. Gosh, that's been a long year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been an amazing year too. Mm -hmm. I, actually, it might be a little longer than a year, but mm -hmm. uh, not even to this last six months have I really put a lot of my energy. Mm -hmm. The first Metatron uh, video or audio we released was on YouTube, and it got a lot of good feedback. But then uh, a friend of mine, Ruben Langdon, uh, someone who I've developed a friendship with, did his TV show, which was Interview with Extra Dimensionals. And he put that out there, and that ended up being, um, for the longest time, uh, right around first and second place of all the videos he released, uh, along with Barbara Lamb. And those two videos had the highest exposure rate for him. And it's something that was so shocking to me, even though I know people connect really well with Metatron, that energy was so foreign to me. Um, it was just a very, very weird experience jumping into that side of the swimming pool when I've been in the shallow end for so long. And, uh, well, not really shallow end, but a different end of the pool, you know? Yeah, exactly. They're just different waters. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was, so I had kind of the reverse because I started really connecting in with more angelic consciousness, that more angelic consciousness. And then that allowed me to open up to feel these other energies, but I didn't have the awareness to know what they were. So um, actually the friend who recommended you to me is uh, Vashta Narada, we, ha we share her, and I just absolutely love and adore her also. Oh yes. <laughs> Can't wait to pin her down to be on the show too. <laughs> 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 she is amazing, amazing human being, and uh, the artwork she does is just hands down. Um, there's only a couple artists I've ever met that have that same kind of energy where they're able to just channel 
that type of consciousness. Yeah, that beautiful artwork there. Uh, Ardiff Treb, she's depicted Metatron. Um, she even depicted um, my fiance, Kalina Angel. She channels uh, Arturian Collective. And mm. three beings out of that kind of step forward for me to uh, kind of look at in an astral projected state. So she did those three for her too. Um, hands down the most accurate energetically and the physical appearance. I, I really love Vasha. She just knows how to put her excitement into energy and channel it through that way. I completely agree. Uh, when I first stumbled upon her, um, I, I can't remember exactly how we connected, but I remember, I think it was in a group and I saw this person had commented with this profile pic and it was one of the Arcturians. And I was like, oh my God, I see that. I see that face like that, not exactly that being, but that species and, and in my meditations and dreams. And I was like, I have to know that person. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she's amazing. She fell into our life. Uh, me and my fiance's when I first started really sharing, there was a time I shared for about a year and a half or two uh, with my channelings with just Treb, uh, mm -hmm. which is the handsome fellow on the far left of the screen. He, um, me and him had connected for a while and she started following uh, the channeling right before it started going into a more mainstream. Um, at a point, there was an interview I did with a friend of mine uh, who's also a channeler, Brad Johnson, and after that, then people started really picking up that energy and kind of checking out the work we were doing. And I think it was either right around that time or right before that time when Vashta kind of fell into my life. And then through my connection with her and my fiance, which back then we were just really good friends, uh, we all kind of created this really great friendship. So Vashta is one of, one of the nicest, uh, most direct, most real people you could ever meet in the world. I love her. I agree. I, and, and, and I agree completely that my, what I seek and value in people is transparency, integrity, and, um, and a bravery, a willingness to stand fully in themselves no no matter what it calls out of you <laughs> to do so <laughs> and she is definitely that to a t it's beautiful Absolutely. i wanted to ask you about that so is Tre is treb the first species or being excuse me that you con connected with and started channeling consciously <laughs> Yeah, Treb was the very first and I never I never even knew what channeling was before I met Treb. I knew about mediumship, I knew about psychic. Uh, mm -hmm. I used to belong to a church called a spiritualism church and mm -hmm. their whole goal is to connect with people who had died on the other side so mm -hmm. that they can gain access and verification that mm -hmm. there is an afterlife and there is a God. And mm -hmm. They did that, and I followed that church for a while um, after getting out of a very bad spot in my life, very dark place for almost a decade. I got into that church, and they taught me how to meditate, and I continued to con uh, continue to want to learn and continue to build uh, meditation techniques. And I ended up, after a long night, uh, a very rough night energetically, I went to e equal myself out and even my energy out. And when I did, that's when I met Treb. And when I say I met him, people say, oh, so you know, he came and landed in your backyard. <laughs> uh, not quite that me. Uh, the way I met him was in a meditation, I'm able to actual project. And that was my very first full functioning, realistic, uh, astral projection that I'd ever had in my life and it was so surreal and so realistic and so in sync um, it just blew me away so I met him and it scared me and then after I opened myself to feel his energy it calmed me and then we met and, and I worked with him in that way just astral projected state for two years and then after that and I said, hey, you know, I had investigated the field thoroughly by then. Me and Treb had had so many in-depth conversations that I said, I know channeling's possible. I know it's a possibility to bring your energy through me and share this information that he shared with me that basically changed my whole life. And I said, let's do that. You know, let's share this together. And uh, at that point, then I started channeling him, which is very weird. A lot of people 
mm -hmm. channel tell their stories and there's so many different ways but most of them end up connecting in meditation um, verbally or energetically and me being able to see and experience them in real time is such a profound energy and such a life-changing energy not just before then but even now to this day I'm able to go visit him hang out with them whenever I want so now he was once this great metaphysical teacher this great uh, energetic uh, <laughs> teacher of abundance and greatness and, and how to fix my life and now he's just one of my friends you know it's like hey Trev's my guy it feels like I've known him uh, forever like I do my childhood friends so <laughs> It's a unique energy and Trev was always there for me. And when I found him, he opened up the door to all these different entities. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's awesome. I know that when I, um, after I started becoming more aware of what was happening while I was working with energy and feeling energy coming through and recognizing that, you know, the, the human vessel is a conduit for energy. Um, and I listened to your, um, uh, a channeling of Treb actually I think it was you know probably right before you started doing the Metatron stuff and it made all of my seat feel hot and vibrating and I asked Vashta about it I was like why does I feel like I'm sitting on a hot buzzing rock <laughs> and she said that's because that's w the way that energy comes into the vessel is through the root chakra and it was so ever since then I always know when I'm connecting with the reptilian because that's how they come in. And I'm like, uh, and you taught me that. <laughs> well, well, it's amazing how we teach each other. You're welcome. And, and you know, for you to teach me that too, a lot of people experience Trev in such different ways. Um, that experience that you had with the seat and the warmth and the coming in, that's uh, really unique. And that's a lot of people experience them through a various subtle energies, but some people just get blasted with that energy. Mm. Um, we just got back from Asheville, uh, North Carolina, doing our yearly event that we do, our workshop down there. And Kalina, um, my fiance and partner, she is kind of giving people the information as Treb's channeling and kind of pointing out, hey, you, your question, your turn. So she's getting these people lined up to energetically connect to Treb. And she had this brilliant idea that everybody should give Treb a hug. Because <laughs> when, if you've ever seen Treb channel, and if you haven't, it's an experience. But if you have, you see this great, huge, loving energy. And he's got a funny voice, and a lot of people don't get past that initially, but he's got this very deeply heart-centered energy. Mm -hmm. So everyone got a chance to hug him, and the number one thing that they all said is, I never felt a heart chakra energy so large before in my life. Mm -hmm. When I got into the auric presence of Rob, when, when Treb was through me, then I felt this heart just open up and I felt like it was just a gigantic vibrating ball in my chest. Mm -hmm. So to feel that energy and to have it explained how other people experience them, it's amazing. You know, when I experience them, it's a very one-sided energy. It's just <laughs> me and him hanging out and I don't have contact with what people are doing outside while I'm channeling everyone else is a mystery to me it's just me and Trev so to hear them and you know to watch back the video it's it's really amazing so have you ever watched a video of yourself channeling Trev oh yeah I, it's it's something that I don't tell everybody but actually I will for editing purposes or if someone says hey there's really really great information on here you need to listen to mm -hmm. then I might check it out um, sometimes when I'm channeling them uh, for a show or interviews or something then I watch it back for content uh, just for my own personal desires of, of wondering what happened and stuff mm -hmm. but when it comes down to it it's kind of very difficult to watch yourself oh I know <laughs> no memory of what's going on so <laughs> It's weird. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, um, uh, so what I'm curious is, uh, when you are, ha when you watch other people who are channeling an energy or experience other people who are channeling an energy, do you have any physical sensations that, of that energy or feel the consciousness coming through you as well at all? Is, what, what is that experience like for you? 
All right, so now before uh, last year, I only did events by myself or like me and Kalina would put together events for everybody. And so I was the only channeler who was channeling and the way I channel there, even though everybody channels to an extent or channels in a different way. So I, I was always able to just experience people through video and certain channelers, ones who I find high resonance with, one whose energy aligns, then there are sensations, especially when I do a technique that I taught myself during meditation, which I, I just simply call the closed eye technique, where I close my eyes, I'm able to feel energy better. Mm -hmm. So when there's a channeler who's presenting uh, on video, I would just shut my eyes and mm -hmm. then I could feel a lot of energy. And if they were really aligned channelers and really powerful, uh, low filter channelers, then sometimes their energy would speak into me. Like when I would listen to, for instance, uh, Nora Harold, Wendy Kennedy, they, they channeled Pleiadian collectives. So I would be able to have access to some of that Pleiadian energy and be able to gain great insight. And it wasn't a direct dialogue because at that point I didn't do direct dialogues in my channeling. Mm -hmm. I would only trans channel and have them come through me and then have an inner dialogue in that astral state with Treb or I would be able to just kind of get downloads. But as it started shifting, we started doing more events and we did this thing called the channel panel where we got all these other channelers to join mm -hmm. and do an all channeler event. Now when that happened, that was seriously one of the most powerful experiences in my life, hands down. I have seven other channelers with me, plus all the people like uh, Kalina is a channeler too. She didn't present for that, but there were dozens of people in the audience who are also channelers who just were there uh, to have an exciting time and to hang out. All of these great uh, vessels of energy, all of these conduits of energy in one spot, and every time another entity channeled, I could feel so strongly through my whole chakra system, in my throat chakra, in my third eye, even communication with these other entities occurred in my body, and it was so powerful it was almost at the end of the two days, I was exhausted because <laughs> I only worked. I, I mean, it exhausts me to work with my energy, but to work with, you know, seven other humongous energies, plus all the people, plus all the creations, plus doing the work, plus channeling myself, it became so powerful and so strong that it actually knocked me out. And on the way back on the airplane, because we left the next morning after the event, I'm in the airplane and I'm nodding off and I, you know, when you get to know me, I'm a, a very grounded person. It's not very frequently I become ungrounded, but that was the most untethered from my earthly experience I ever felt in my life. So uh, that was an ama amazing adventure. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you were talking about it, I have this um, habit where I'm, I have a, a, a deep curiosity. <laughs> I've been called on it before by other people where I, as soon as somebody starts to talk about an experience, I am, I send my consciousness there and start checking out the experience. And as you were talking, my whole jaw started to clench up my head. You know, for me, that's all the physical symptoms of like uh, energy coming through it. It was so strong. <laughs> So yeah, that's an amazing gift. <laughs> that was like really intense because my if I start if I'm tearing and my head and physical body is shifting, then I know it's really strong energy because that's where I still have some issues of energy flowing through me, not in the right alignment. But I <laughs> was like, whoa! And I had looked at those pictures when I was trying to decide what pictures to put up of you of that channel panel. And I really wanted to put those up, but I didn't want to overwhelm us with too many images. <laughs> and you, you probably, uh, being able to have the experience you do, I can only imagine you probably felt a very uh, exciting presence in the channel panel. Well, there's, there was so many levels. It was funny, actually, as you listed each aspect, um, it, it, it sent this burst, like, yes, now this is that one. Now this is that one. Now that is that one. It was like, oh, oh. <laughs> and I was just trying to be quiet. <laughs> because 
my body is really physically reactive to energy, you know, and I really do feel it through the system. And that's one of the things that um, always scared me as a child about energies and channeling and all of that. So I had shut all that down and it's been this awakening process, but uh, this is really much more intense right now with you. I, I'm thinking it's your field as well. I'm tapped into. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing that you say that too, that experience kind of allowing you to shut down. It's a theme that's really been playing out, not just in the work we've been doing lately, uh, but my fiance and her work, she, she extensively goes in there mm -hmm. because she had a lot of experiences as a young child with channeling uh, psychic experiences um, all of those energies that she felt and experienced, she actually became overwhelmed by the people's response to them. She would share her experiences and mm -hmm. people just ignored her or, uh, you know, made fun of her, tried to degrade her. So that energy kind of shut her down. And we've noticed that that's a theme. A lot of people in their young teens or even younger are kind of shutting down energetically. It's, it's funny you said that because that's something that we've really, really been engaged in the last two months, exploring mm -hmm. that very in depth. Mm -hmm. um, I have as well, actually. Um, I have been, my whole focus um, this year, this calendar year so far in 2016, has been how do I remove these filters that I adopted in order to protect myself? And how do I come back into wholeness with, with the complete understanding of the energy and the balance that's required in order to harmonize it within? So it is really, I think, um, in the air right now. You know, there are many of us that are working on that. And I kind of view it as we collectively are healing the throat chakra of humanity as we come up the chakra system and evolve. Because that's, I think that's what this year is really seeming to be about. Absolutely. It's, it's something that is so important uh, for humanity to look at mm -hmm. is, is what the filters are and, and where they're blocking energy. Um, most people, you know, the average human, you go down and say, hey, I bet you want to learn how to channel. <laughs> they might not even know what you're talking about, but those who know what channeling is, mm -hmm. there's been a huge desire from the collective to learn it. Mm -hmm. And my own excitement lately is that I used to have 95% one-on-one -on -one, uh, channeling sessions. That, as far as my work went, that's what I did. Mm -hmm. I would just connect with one-on-one -on -one people and Trev Ardiff, whoever would do a reading. But since 2016, there have been hundreds of people who want to get channeling classes. They mm -hmm. want to learn to channel. And I've offered that for a while, but just this year, it's been really exciting. And the one thing that I've realized more than anything it has something to do with filters. It has something to do uh, with the way people think about channeling. But the main thing that is, is very unexplored by a lot of people in sharing how to channel is the self-trust. When people have filters, you know, if you, if you do, you're human, mm -hmm. and that's normal. Yeah. And all of us have it, even the greatest channelers you've ever heard, I can guarantee you, <laughs> have issues and filters. But... When you trust yourself and allow that energy to come through, that's when it really shines. That's when most people who, who think, I can never channel, once they believe in themselves and trust that the energy they're getting is what's meant to be received, that's when you see people who have tried for 10 years. Uh, one person I've had who took a channeling class for me on her first channeling class she channeled. She has been working on channeling for 25 years and now she channels. And that was the biggest hurdle is the self-trust and the trusting what comes in. And we all have that to a degree. We see it every day in our lives. You know, should I do this, that? Am I really doing the best I can? But that self-trust is really the key that unlocks all of that for most people. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree. I have, um, that's one of the reasons I, I, this year I've started building um, a class all around that where it's, I, at first I called it the life compass class because what I, what I found through my, because I used to work as individual sessions, work and do all individual session work, one-on-one -on -one work. And I realized this is, there's certain things that everybody needs to know and understand once they start tapping in and connecting to source energy and that all healing work roots around 
tapping into some consciousness energy that is more in whole vibration with itself, more aligned vibration, to give your vessel an opportunity to feel that vibration and then adjust itself accordingly. I mean, that's the root of it. So uh, I wanted people to know what is it to tap into your whole vibration, which is essentially how do you channel you <laughs> and use that you to guide you, you know? And mm. So how do you feel in your body what is truth and then what is expansive and what is inexpansive? And then it becomes a process of breaking the beliefs of right and wrong. And once you get into those spaces, you can do anything, you know. So I think that I think if people become more aware that healing work is channeling, that we can shift our fractured focus and intention of all these groups that say, well, I do this and I do that and I just do this and go, no, actually, we're all doing it. We're just using a different language. <laughs> I, I love it. that. The, the, the way you said you're teaching people too, and and the the type of teaching that's so beautiful. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. Everybody's channeling, and that channeled energy comes to different people in different ways. Um, I had one person say, you know. I'm learning how to channel this and that, but my family, they're so closed down to this stuff. Uh, it's like they'll never be able to channel. So I said, well, well, what about, you know, tell me a little bit about your dad, your mom. And he said, my dad is just a workaholic. All he ever does is work. Uh, he's a successful salesperson, but the rest of his life, he's got no personality. He has no desire for family, all of these things. And I said, but he's channeling at his work. If he's a successful salesman, he's channeling his energy, his yeah. higher self into that salesmanship. And even though that's not what you like, and that's not <laughs> you, it's for him, that's exactly what's happening. So you're right. Everyone has the capacity, even the people who are kind of shut down to most things in their life, mm -hmm. everyone can pull out one thing in their life and say, this is what I want to work for. This is what excites me. This is what I like, and this is what I'm good at. Mm -hmm. And if they can pick that one thing out, anything can be channeled through it. Yeah, exactly. Um, I remember when I was a teenager, um, I, I, was, I think I was about 19, and I went to this class. This guy hosted it, and he was a world-renowned professional uh, hypnotist. And I, I can't remember his name right now for the life of me, but... It was like Claude something. I don't know. I can't remember his name. But anyway, he lived in Bend and he hosted this evening called the Evening of Enlightenment. And it was the first time I ever saw somebody channel. And, um, and he put this woman into a trance and he um, healed. Well, basically, it was a healing session that I didn't realize at the time. I had no idea, no language for, no conceptualization for. But she was burning at the stake. You know, suddenly this woman laying in a total trance state on the ground around this circle of about 20 people just started writhing and screaming and her body went into this rigid posture of being um, on a stake. Her arms were like tied behind her back and her feet were tied, crossed and she was just like, it was, I, I couldn't imagine her form could hold that state and screaming, you know. And he started, and he just went into this mode and started working with that consciousness to help release the memory of that from the, from her consciousness, and around the language and structure of a past life experience, healing a past life, and it was so powerful for me to witness something like that, to know, oh my God, that is, that is real. That was for real. <laughs> And it further scared me, you know, at the time. And, uh, and it made me realize uh, that people need to be, uh, that we, we as people need to be more conscious and careful about what we open. And that is one of the reasons that I love the energies that you channel, because these concepts, like we have so much fear built up around reptilians and reptoid and um, all of that. And if you feel Treb at all. <laughs> it's like nothing to be afraid of there. <laughs> like <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a bit of an understatement. It's uh <laughs> a lot of people associate yeah. that and and the negativity surrounding that. I see what you mean. It's um 
the reptilian energy is a scary one. And, and if yeah. it's by the picture, Treb is reptilian human hybrid. And yeah. his energy is so loving yeah. that that's one of the main things I get in feedback from people is you have helped heal the reptilian wounds within me, within my family, within our group, within my lineage, my DNA, whatever the case is, my past lives, knowing that there is no such thing as all negative anything or all positive anything, that everything is in a spectrum. Our perception helps guide us to that spectrum. And what's good for one is horrible for another and vice versa. And that everything exists within that that it makes it easier and it's it's funny that that subject is one that probably keeps a lot of people who really are not ready to accept the fact that there could be possible uh, positive reptilians away from the work but once they end up finding that maybe it's a possibility maybe it could happen then they're ready to engage and like you said once you hear once you feel once you experience Treb it's over from that point. Yeah. In fact, this, this one idea was so strong in my own awareness and so strong going through this kind of galactic racism that exists with reptilians. <laughs> well, I love that term. I'm sorry. Galactic racism. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I love it. No. Yes. My husband's no. from India. So racism is a term that is in our house. We're constantly aware of that. And that is the exact Bang on. Thank you. Go on. <laughs> absolutely. No, absolutely. It's, it's a point that since I've started channeling, Treb has talked about, I myself, Treb doesn't care if people judge him or not. He's right. like, I mean, he's, he's a fifth density uh, type one loving being, so he doesn't care if you hate him. No. But I care if people hate him. <laughs> I love him. And yeah. Because he does represent such great thing. So I've advocated for him and shared. And I even took my time. I'm talking with probably the most uh, well-known channeler of ETs. Um, well, one of the two most famous channelers, um, Daryl Anka on an interview. And I, I asked him, reptilians, why, do, why does everyone think they're negative and evil? Um, have you heard from Bashar or experienced in your own energy positive reptilians? And he said, the reason why you and all the people who are starting to align with your work are going towards understanding that there is positive reptilians is because you guys are starting to energetically align your own self with what's possible out there, with what these beings actually represent the reason why so many people experience the negative version of reptilians is because that's what their brain, that's what their beliefs and that's what their history uh, that's taught from other people has told them. So once they come to acknowledge the fact, Hey, there could be a possibility that not all reptilians are bad or there is a possibility. And I'm pretty sure that there can be good reptilians then boom, it opens up a whole new door. And I thought for the guy who's been doing this longest, the guy who most everyone trusts when it comes to extraterrestrial channelings can express that publicly, mm -hmm. that is one of the greatest wins I've ever had for, for my ad, advocating for Trevor yeah. and my whole journey. Uh, and I know my ego tells me uh, that it's important and it's not because – whether I, I've been used to people making fun of channeling reptilians since the beginning and I've developed a thick skin, but just to be able to say it for those who are open to that experience so that they can grab onto it so yeah. that they can experience that's, that's what I want to do. And that's what I've been uh, so elegantly trying to fight for. And I feel like a big, big hill of that battle got achieved just a, a couple nights ago so yeah. I'm excited about that <laughs> yeah I agree I love when you I was listening to your uh, interview with him yesterday and um, I love that when you asked that question and I was like yes. <laughs> because one of the things that I feel is so important and that we miss uh, is is that we can, as long as we're looking at things in terms of good and bad we already are pre-filtering the information that's coming through and it's one of the things that i work on the the first thing i work on with my students is okay stop thinking of it in that terms it is it is either constructive 
deconstructive or supportive. Now, what are you trying to do? What do you want to accomplish? Do you want to move? Then you need deconstructive and you need to get the flow going. Do you want to stay and build? Then you need some constructive to slow things down. You know, and hey, is everything great? Then you just want to keep supporting it. You know, so that's, that's all that it is. And if things are deconstructing around you, look at why. So it's that same concept with the approach towards fear-based connections with these beings. If you are getting from them fear, then that's the filter you are putting. And that's all that comes through because, yes, that is an aspect of all things that are in alignment and wholeness with themselves but it isn't the wholeness of those things. You're absolutely right. That's all one can experience when that expectation, the only experience that exists. Mm -hmm. That's how the universe works. You're like, universe, I am so afraid of reptilians in the universe. Like the loving entity that it is says, here you go. We're going to prove you right. Very reptilians. <laughs> yep. You wanted them, you've got them. With love, we give them to you. Yeah. Absolutely. I, yeah. I like that too when you said putting the filter on uh, for that bad experience. You're absolutely right. Nothing can get through that. But, yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. Well, it's, it's funny too. I mean, this is, I feel like all of this is in the collective understanding right now. We're all grappling with this right now so we can anchor it in that web of consciousness for humanity. Um, my uh, friend just showed me a Teal Swan video yes, last night. Um, and I've been working on these filters and removing them and lenses and thinking in these terms, kind of, you know, in my own intimate personal work as I develop my next curriculum. And here she's talking about exactly that in this relationship broadcast and how we put on, and she puts these sunglasses on and she's like, we put on these filters. And I was like, oh my God, I've been saying that. He's like, I know that's why I wanted you to watch this. <laughs> oh, oh, nice. And so, and I love that. And I think I wanted to also say um, in the part where you mentioned that your ego and you felt a little bit softening by that. Um, remember confirmation keeps us strong in our, in our presentation and we're counterbalancing for humanity. So there's a huge weight that tries to tell us we are wrong. So it's okay to inflate a little bit when we get the confirmation and go, oh. <laughs> Absolutely. That's beautifully said. <laughs> <laughs> so I was also wanting to ask you, um, when I saw the first picture that Vashta had done of um, Ardith, this just chill went through me and um, I told her I said okay so I looked through all the images that you do and I know I'm connecting to two of them and Ardiff was one of them and Bashar was the other one and she was like oh really oh well Rob channels Ardiff <laughs> and so I listened to one of your early channelings of Ardiff and I was like oh that's the voice <laughs> <laughs> And I have had, I believe, Ardiff guiding me, I, th I would have to say since as long as I can remember. Since childhood, it's been this voice. And, um, and I would have people ask me questions and out would come this truth and in that way of speaking and manner. And people used to say things to me like, um, you sound like, what country are you from? Where are you from? And I was like, here. Well, you don't always sound like you're from here. You have an accent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you, how did you connect with Ardiff? And tell me about that story. All right. This little different than Treb. Uh, I, I'm working with Treb. And uh, from the first time I met him, not the exact first time, but the first few times I met him on through when I accepted that this entity was connected to me, when I accepted that what I was experiencing was the truth, then I started being able to go down that path with Trev about learning. I wanted to know everything. And a lot of the times he would talk about this being, and he called uh, the being Dinib Cygnus, which is the star Dinib and then the constellation Cygnus, mm -hmm. the swan. So he'd call this entity Dinib Cygnus, and told me a great deal about what this entity was to him, what information this entity, and basically what I gathered from it originally was that this being was to Treb as Treb is to me. 
Mm. It's Treb's guy, Treb's uh, higher density counterpart, the place where Treb goes to get information if he can't find it within himself, Mm. a reflection of a higher perspective. So he talked to me and talked to me and even did a video about it. One of the very first probably 20 videos we did, he talked about Dean of Cygnus and the IC1101 constellation in a story or uh, sorry, not Constellation, the galaxy, and talked about a story from that galaxy and how it related to humanity. And it was a very beautiful story. It was about these races of humanoid beings that lived in the same solar system, but spread out throughout three different planets. And they were just getting to the part where they were able to communicate with one another, and they were getting ready to go through an ascensional process. So this is a really cool story, a really in-depth, cool story that Treb told us that came from this being. So as I go through, I'm connecting with Treb and I get a call from this guy from uh, Brazil and his name is Jefferson Viscardi. He had worked with uh, two other channelers who I was aware of and did books with each one of them, co-authored books. And what he wanted to do was get Treb, talk to him and transcribe every conversation we had and create a book with it. So I agreed, we started. Uh, During that time, his idea was to find out what the day in the life of Treb was, what his race was about, their history, um, all those things. And then he wanted to bring some different representatives from Treb's friends, like the groups of entities and beings that Treb's race hangs out with. So he said, we wanna learn something very expansive about the universe. So he said, I'm going to bring in one of my guides. And he brought forward this being who identified himself as Aradif. In this book, now remember too, this book was done about a year or so after I started channeling publicly. So it was very early on. But in this 20 some pages of the book with this entity named Aradif was the most profound information that I had ever heard channeled before. Now, granted, at this point, I did not do a lot of listening to other channelers. It was not in my excitement. I wanted to make sure what I was getting in wasn't picked up or terminology was adopted. So I kept myself pretty clear of most channelers. I was aware of Bashar, um, Lee Carroll. I was aware of uh, Jane, Seth Roberts. But those were about the only three channelers I ever heard of. And I only listened to them for a little bit to kind of confirm some of the truths that me and Treb were working through. So at that point, bringing through this information, um, it was put out and it told us about the construct of the universe. It talked to us about densities, what levels, all of this really in-depth scientific sounding stuff. And I talked to Treb and I said, we need to connect with Ardiff more. So after that, Ardiff came through, through my own physical body, a lot like he did in the book, Treb connected to me and then Treb would connect to Ardiff and kind of make like a telephone uh, (laughs) telephone line. So we played that way for a little while. And out of the blue, when my excitement started growing, um, Ardiff came in and told Kalina during one of her radio shows where she was doing an interview with Treb that she wanted, that he wanted to start working with me and Kalina more uh, regularly, more consistently. So at that point, I had only really connected with Treb and Treb channeled art if I was channeling him, if that makes sense. After that, he started connecting to me directly. At that point, we started knowing a lot more about him. Now, in the first book, he described himself as an ancient Pleiadian or a Denebian. And a Denebian is from the star Denib, and ancient Pleiadian talks about their race moving away from the Pleiades to go inhabit Denib. So they're tied in very deeply with Pleiadian and that Denebian energy. Mm -hmm. He also described himself about three foot nine, uh, blue skin, purple hair, large purple eyes, and would appear very humanoid looking to us. Now, since then, I've learned so much about RNF. I learned what, like when you look at humans, you can say humans come from apes, even though that's not really accurate. Mm -hmm. That would be the lineage, kind of, you know, Mm -hmm. going through. That was our second density being, and our third density being was humans. Well, their second density being was an animal that looks like um, a lemur, 
mixed with a meerkat without hair, purple, and purple eyes, mm -hmm. a blue skin and then purple eyes. And it looked very weird and oblong, but that's what they came from. And I learned more and more about them, but still to this day, we don't know a lot about his race, his culture. Whenever anyone asks him, hey, what does your planet look like? What happens on your planet? What do your people do? Like with Treb, Treb just say, yeah, this is everything that happens. Here you go. Artists like we're reserving that for a time when it's needed. We'll reserve that for a time when we can share that. So there's a really big part of mystery that hangs out with Ardeth. But in working with them for the last two or three years so intimately, um, myself and Kalina have got to know who he is as an energy. Uh, Kalina's been able to see him. She drew a picture of him before, which uh, she showed to Vashta. Vashta also channels the artwork she does. So she was able to take what Kalina had said uh, what Kalina had drew and draw this amazing art in front of you. And I've been able to experience some uh, by flashes of views. So I know who he is. I know that he's connected to Treb. I think the difference between the experience with being so close up and intimate with Treb compared to Ardiff is first Treb is more connected to me energetically. Like he's more like um, a connection of my now version that's easier to connect to. Mm -hmm. Well, Ardiff seems to be much more in the future. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the difference in the energy and, and how I came to meet Ardiff. Now, um, what, I'm, what I'm noticing as you're telling me the story of this is a progression. So first you were connecting with Treb, who uh, when I connect with Treb, I feel that in my root chakra. And then you were connecting with Ardiff. Um, and when I connect with Ardiff, I really feel him in my chest. I wouldn't necessarily say my heart or my third, but maybe that whole region. And when I, when I connect with, um, I don't connect with Metatron directly, although I have connected with that energy at points, especially when I'm listening to you channel him. Um, I connect in with, as I mentioned earlier, Gabriel. And that is very much this feeling that just comes down and washes over from the top. So it's almost as though what I'm sensing is this progression that built you into a status of being able to connect with that more whole cohesive consciousness, which we consider to be like an archangel or galactic angel consciousness. Absolutely. And, and you hit the nail on the head with that one. It's really about my own expansion and energy, which allows me to get to those higher realms of energy. Um, when I, when I teach people channeling, the first way, the first thing we do is I get their definition of channeling. Then I give them this one. Mm -hmm. I say, if you can visualize yourself in the center of a room at a party, dozens of people there, they're each at different angles, different distances, and you yourself are in the middle of the room. Your body represents your consciousness, okay? Mm. So if your consciousness and body were to expand, you're going to hit the person and bump into the person who's standing two foot to your right. When you do that, you're able to hear what this person has to say, a room full of loud people. You can't hear unless you're right next to them. They start talking to you. You gain more experience through talking to that person. You gain a new insight, uh, a new overall way to look at things. Then you start growing more. And then you can get to the person 10 foot to the left of you. And you talk with them and you grow more. And then the people at the edge of the room. So the more that you connect with these beings, the more they become intimately acquainted with you. You're not, when you're channeling, you're not just pulling on an energy and allowing it through your body so that that energy can talk to others. You're completely melding your energy, an amalgamation of two beings into one consciousness. And you're sharing that higher perspective. So the more that you do this with these beings, the more that you channel and bring the intimacy of their connection into your life, the more you can expand, the more that you start feeling connecting to the energy of those beings who have already made an intimate bond with you and you take on properties. And I've noticed that when I first started channeling Treb, I still was very rough around the edges. I had just only been out of that deep depressed lifestyle for a little less than uh, three or four years altogether. Mm -hmm. After that, after spending a year with him, so much of what he was teaching to other people, what he was sharing with me became usable. 
and I could actually integrate it easily when before I would struggle so strongly with the simplest of concepts. Mm -hmm. And the more integration of the energy, the more I could express it. And then after really feeling like I mastered my connection with Treb, that's when Ardiff came along. And Ardiff, it was not very long at all before I mastered my connection with him. It was mm -hmm. such a, a natural process. And then on to the Nihal, which is a collective consciousness, and then Metatron. And, you know, all of a sudden I'm just, like ever since I started connecting to Ardiff, uh, between that time where, where I had just first started channeling Ardiff to the time I felt like I was really getting good with Treb, mm -hmm. uh, from that time I had channeled dozens of other extraterrestrial consciousnesses that Treb would kind of link to me. And it wasn't the telephone game like it was with Ardiff at first. Mm -hmm. It was me connecting to Treb and Treb saying, these entities want to talk to you, and then linking me directly to them. Mm -hmm. And then after Ardiff, Ever since then, I've channeled over 150 ET consciousnesses. Mm -hmm. So the more expansive I get in my communication with the two, the more I'm able to get from them on the other side of it. And that's what really makes this whole thing work. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> I have also found, um, you know, the more that you connect in and the more... Um, you know, for me, the visual that comes through is just being, is being this conduit, this really, um, just really like a tap opening up. And, and as it's flowing through, I, I feel myself as the tap and I feel the energy, you know, coming through. And the more you hold that energy, the more your own, um, that, that energy influences the tap. <laughs> it, you know, yes. It, it, it changes the way the tap shapes itself to hold the energy. And, um, and so it has definitely helped me in really unearthing the parts of myself that were unconscious. I was unconsciously aware of completely. And I, I don't think I could have found them had I not had the comparison of these other energies that were in the body and how the body felt and responded and reacted and interpreted and perceived when those energies were in. Absolutely. And it makes perfect sense too, that you experience what you connect to and what you are changes. And people I think get really stuck in on the whole linear time thing, mm -hmm. but you see how that experiences changes the past the future and the energy you're in now all at once and it kind of gives you that sneak peek into how time really works mm -hmm. that vibration that goes through you it changes yourself and all things about yourself including that time it's amazing insight mm -hmm. you know um you had mentioned earlier about how the first time you experienced trev was when you asked for projected uh, for me about five years ago um, I, well, I had an astral projection experience when I was a child, with child teen, late, early teens, late childhood, um, where I had moved and I, um, I missed one of my friends, a good friend that I had a strong connection with. And so I, I had a dream where I woke up and I was laying in her bed and she rolled over and she's like, what are you doing here? And I was like, well, I just was missing you. And we kind of had this whispered conversation and she was like, okay, I have to go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. And I was like, no, don't go. If you go, I'm going to go. And she's like, well, you don't have to go. And I looked over and at the clock there, it said um, 3.33 a.m. And when I woke up, I, I woke up in my body and I was like, oh, that was such an awesome dream. I totally miss her. You know, and I looked at the clock and it, it was uh, 5.53 a.m. And I was that many hours ahead of her, you know, for where I was staying at. And so that was like my very first astral projection that I would know of or re um, could remember really consciously. So I, and then I thought, well, that was just a funny dream. Um, but I was talking with this woman, you know, five years ago, and she wanted me to be one of their um, admins on um, this Aliens Are Here page. Uh, and because I've always been very curious about aliens, but from the physical perspective, I had no concept at all of the energetic spiritual connection. In fact, I couldn't figure out how to marry the two worlds. You know? <laughs> 
And she said, oh, you're a medium. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm not a medium. I know what mediums are like, and I'm, I'm not one of those. <laughs> 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 and so she said, well, I want you to go to sleep tonight with some Labradorite on your chest, and I want you to um, allow yourself to, for the possibility to be true that you are and see what happens. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I totally had one of the most powerful um, experiences where I woke up and um, I was walking through this spaceship and I could hear my boots on the, on the metal grate. And it wasn't like, um, it was, a, I, my dad was a step, my stepfather was a Lieutenant commander on a battleship. So I've been in, you know, battleships and um, on other Marine, you know, military vessels and it wasn't quite that way but sort of <laughs> um enough that it seemed that uh reminiscent of that but everything was a different kind of metal than they we use in our military stuff here at least so i i was taking note of all these things these weird details and um, i'm walking and i'm walking with a group of people and i can't really see them but i feel them around me and, and they keep slapping me on the back and they're like great you're back man you took forever <laughs> you know, <laughs> all of this stuff and, and um we ended up walking into this room and it was this huge open space room where it was like a sphere of light and everyone was standing all around in this sphere in different places and i was um I remember just feeling this wave of energy come over my whole body that really rocked me. And it was this feeling of your home, you know, just like, Oh my God, that I am home. Like this is it. And everyone's just, it's silent in the room, but it's not, you know? And when I woke up the next morning, I messaged the lady and I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> you're not going to believe what happened. <laughs> And it was shortly after that that I was contacted by my teacher, who ended up being my teacher, this master healer. And she was, she contacted me and she said, I, I feel connected to you and I, I want to know what your practice is. And I'm like, well, I'm a clothing designer, so I don't have a practice, but I do have a business. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's when that was like what opened everything for me in the healing world and then once I got enough of a grip of energy and how to work with it it opened up the consciousness so I love how you um how you talked about that that the that that was a similar experience for you a similar awakening point is that is that out-of-body experience it's amazing to to, to watch you know, you have your story, I've got my story, and you notice that all things happen exactly as they're supposed to. Even, you know, like in my time of depression, mm -hmm. if you would ask me then, what, what are you going to do with your life? You know, probably die young, probably <laughs> not make a lot of anything in my life, probably destroy lives all around mm -hmm. me, all of this really grim, horrible stuff. And mm -hmm. when I look now, I had to have that experience. And right as weird or odd as some of these experiences sound to people, all of these experiences are needed. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny with your story about your friend, there's something that I've really not told a lot of people, um, but I had an experience like that, but it was just a little different. I had an experience um, where my favorite band in the world, these people have followed their music since I was 12 years old from 1992 and I listened to them my whole adult life they were there with me for my depression my best times so every time this music is just energetically aligned with who I am mm -hmm. it can uh, trigger any gamut of emotions at any moment with me mm -hmm. I just really in the band I love the 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 people involved in it I went to see them in concert for the very first time and it was 2011, I think, or tw uh, 2011, yeah. And I was so excited. At, at the end of the concert, they said, all right, everybody, we're going to be at this bar, so-and-so. Well, at that point, I didn't drink. I, I never drank a lot mm -hmm. throughout my whole life. But I said, I want to go to that bar. Well, the person I was with at that time, uh, my son's mother, when we were in that relationship, she was with me and she said, I don't want to go. I'm not feeling well. So I kind of just said, okay, well, then we're not going to go. And I was so bothered by that the whole night. I was like, 
in my mind, all I could do was say, I want to be there with those guys. Mm -hmm. So I go to sleep and I have this dream mm -hmm. that I'm at the bar with them and that I am talking to the uh, lead guitarist, second head singer guy. And I'm like, hey, where's the other guy? The band is mean. So I was like, hey, where's mm -hmm. Gene at? And he's not, you know, he's acting like an ass. He's backstage, uh, you know, back in a private room. He's really not getting along with anybody, la, la. And I said, wow, man, it would be nice to hang out with all of you guys. And they said, <laughs> here. So I wake up and I'm like, that was a weird dream. I said, I guess my desire just kind of pushed me into creating that in my dream. Well, later I found out that the band was having turmoil and that one person in my dream who wasn't there was actually getting ready to leave the band and they broke oh. up from that moment. So I asked Trev, I said, how could I have, you know, was that me having premonitions? He said, no, when people drink the alcohol, can open up their crown chakra. And that's why people have really good experiences or really bad because their energy and their beliefs, but it can open up the crown chakra. Your excitement was so strong that when you left your body, you jumped in the body of a guy who was very drunk mm -hmm. and started talking to him mm -hmm. and experiencing that experience. So I'm like, oh my, and now I start feeling bad. I'm like, I just stole somebody's body and all this <laughs> <laughs> like, what am I doing? But it made sense to me. Mm -hmm. And I, eventually I just said, you know, hey, this guy was open to the experience. Otherwise we wouldn't co-create it. But right. to, that you're so powerful of a being that you can join someone in that experience because your excitement is so high. Uh, it's just very relevant of your story. And I wanted to share that mm -hmm. because it was such an amazing and profound experience. And it was something that I had already been channeling and astral projecting, but nothing like that had ever happened to me. So it was pretty amazing. Well, I am so grateful you shared that story. <laughs> <laughs> well, me too now. <laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome. Um, I was talking with one of my friends about, uh, about this, uh, these kind of experiences, and, and he had had a similar experience where he suddenly – um, was in this homeless, like he said, he was pretty sure it was a homeless guy because he kind of crawled out of a box on the, and he was like on the streets in New York city. And he said he stood up and he looked around and some lady looked at him and started screaming and he realized his pants were down around his ankles and he was like, I'm out. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so he was always that he was telling me, I was like, I was always wondering why I went into that guy. But that actually makes sense if the guy was, you know, really drunk and open. And, and here's yeah. what, what pops into my mind as a response to, for both of you guys, if he happens to listen, is perhaps they needed to feel your consciousness streaming through their body. Absolutely. And, Bingo. I love that. I never would have even thought to think about that yeah. aspect of it. But absolutely. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> so I, I feel this need to tell you this other story because I, I think it's probably uh, well the, I'm just going to go with it because you know that's what's happening right now anyway um, <laughs> it's storytelling time so so when I was a kid okay now have you ever connected with any beings that are golden beings I've connected with beings whose skin were golden I've connected with beings who were described by other people's golden energy but when I connect to their energy um, I'm always described or receive the physical attributes of them uh, even light beings people are like yeah you know like art if sixth density he shouldn't be physical why is he mm -hmm. got purple well to their experience is physical but no not specifically to uh, a golden being per se but yes two different kinds so yes and no so i'm curious if perhaps um this will strike something for you and maybe you'll be able to answer something that has been um a question in my life since i was uh, born basically sure uh so when i was born um <clears throat> i had a really horrible placental attachment in the womb uh and my i was born through c-section and when I came out, I was about 21 inches long, if I remember correctly, and under five pounds. So I was so undernourished, you could see my skin was transparent, like you could see my organs. Ooh. And they, you know, the doctor was like, okay, just feed her. <laughs> yeah. Just feed her and feed her and feed her. 
And um, my mom had a hemorrhage, uh, hemorrhaged after the C-section, and she had to stay in the hospital for a period of time afterwards. So I went home, and and uh, uh, the result of all of this was, you know, some some pretty significant trauma that I've been working through in my own shadow work, that work of the unconscious drivers of our filters. And um, when my mother came home from the hospital, she came out of the hospital, and a cab brought her home. And so she got into the cab, and the cab driver, um, you know, she started saying her address, and he said, it's okay, Mikey, I know where we're going. And her name is Michael, and nobody had called her Mikey since childhood. Uh, and so she kind of got this really uncomfortable feeling, but the cab was already going, you know. And then this kind of ease came over her, and he started talking to her. And telling her, you know, how everything was going to be okay and it was going to be all right. And my mother had significant anxiety, you know, panic disorder and a lot of depression and depression and anxiety I struggled with in my 20s, teens and 20s. Um, and he was, you know, just giving her this pep talk, basically. Uh, and when they pulled up to the house, uh, she said, well, how much do I owe you? And he turned around and he turned back to look at her and lifted his baseball cap and, and she could see that his skin was golden and his eyes were these big almond, golden almond eyes. Wow. And he said, it's no charge, Mikey. And she just kind of, she was like, I just stumbled out of the car. <laughs> and her sister was sitting on the porch and, and they kind of looked at each other, but they never spoke of it. And, his, and I know my aunt saw him also. So then, you know, fast forward, I was about three, my brother was, no, I think I was about two, my brother was about four, yeah, he wasn't quite five yet, and, um, and I have memories of this, but I also know this as our family story, but I know this as my soul story, too, so it's like I can put all these different pieces together now as I've evolved more and remembered more. Um, but my um, mother woke up and there was a man in her room and he said, it's time to go. And it was the same man, this golden man. And she was like, well, where are we going? I have the kids, you know, and he goes, well, I'm going to go get the kids and you get ready, you know? <laughs> and so then he comes back and he's holding me and my brother's holding his hand and this, my brother's dragging his little puppy, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and a stuffed puppy. And, um, and he says, okay, let's go, Mikey, you know, and she said, then they kind of dematerialized and materialized on the ship. And this woman came and I remember this woman taking me in arms, you know, and I was just like, for the first time in my life felt safe. <laughs> my life was not a safe place growing up. Um, so that first time just felt this intense, deep safety and I never wanted to leave, you know, and she took me and my brother and I just remember standing with her at this window, just watching the stars, watching different things, different times, different, I can't even describe. And, um, but my mother, her story, uh, is that, you know, he stayed with her and he talked with her and he told her all of these things about, you know, um, he took her to his world that was destroyed. And he said, this is what we did to our world. You know, this is what we have done. And, uh, and you know, humanity is going to learn some very profound lessons in this life, in, in your lifetime, in this experience. And you and many others are going to be guiding and helping and assisting. And, and you know, she just, she, she didn't even take in all the information that he said because she was so overwhelmed by this experience. So the sure. next... Yeah. So the next morning, my brother comes running in and, and he says, Mommy, Mommy, wasn't that such an amazing dream we had? And he showed her, he said, look, I drew the planet. And he had drawn, drawn this planet with, um, I think it was three suns and two moons. No, it was two, two suns and three moons and this landscape that was kind of reddish. And so I've always wondered, like, I always thought that was Pleiadian, but I... I have never heard of, as I've now, an adult, um, you know, researching, I've never heard of the Pleiadians being referenced as golden. Does that bring any, strike any chords for you? Or When, when you say the large almond eyes there and uh, the experience of having a planet destroyed, uh, did they look more human? Yeah. They could pretty much pass. They for could a pretty time. much pass, yeah. Um, then they might be um, some of the gray hybrids that have come along because uh, the grays themselves came from another matrix uh, mm -hmm. because of their experience with their planet being destroyed. They are relatives of humans. They work a lot with humans. They do hybrid. But 
their hybrids are actually look like humans. They look like large eyed humans and the hybrids are much more compassionate, caring and loving. I don't think it would have been the grays uh, disguised as a human Mm -hmm. that experience, but a lot of their hybrids, uh, first, second and third generation hybrids are very open uh, to that human experience. And it, it very well could be that when I think of them connecting to you, uh, the most intimate interactions with humans take place from a lot of those hybrid groups. And I'm not saying all of them do because there's mm-hmm. literally thousands of races that have worked and interacted with humans. Mm-hmm. But I, I, for just some reason, I feel mm-hmm. like that uh, Zeta Reticuli hybrid energy is part Oh, yeah. Of, yeah. That was it right there. <laughs> yeah. Oh. It, it feels right in, in the heart and, and in the solar plexus when I say it. It's a very profound energy and story that you shared because a lot of people go through similar experiences without the amount of communication, and it really terrifies them. And it's so sad to me because I know that there are malevolent or, or negative type of beings that connect to humans who are really emotionally void of the care of what's going on with, with the humans as they interact. But a lot of the ones that work with us have some form of love for us, whether it's that beautiful unconditional love, like you were talking about as you're being held, or even just like, I care about you because I think you're stupid and will kill yourself. So if we don't help, that's still a form of love and they're not mean and they're not cruel. So mm-hmm. um, I really think that's it. I think that oh, yeah. fits. Yeah, I don't know if you can tell, but like tears are just streaming oh. down my face right now. Like I can, and I can strongly feel that energy coming through. That is definitely it. Oh, see, I knew there was a reason they were making me tell that story. Oh, I felt your emotion when you were telling this story. That's why I was like, oh, when you're yeah. telling, I could feel my own swelling up in the throat and in the solar plexus. So, yeah, it sense. Thank you for sharing that because that brings me to a realization too. I, I've learned a lot about that gray hybrid program. I've never, that I remember, interacted personally with them, but I've met so many people who have, and that golden energy just gives me another piece of the puzzle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that that's why we are in this phase right now of wanting to share stories, wanting to tell, wanting to connect to each other because we're trying to bring all these pieces together. Absolutely. That was really intense. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad I'm, like I said at the beginning of our conversation, I'm so uh, excited and proud to be a part of of your journey with you and, and you be a part of my journey because the experience that people will get when they listen to this will be an opportunity to see a different path, a different Mm -hmm. version of the path they're already aware of, or just a different idea. And maybe they need that little piece of the puzzle to finish Mm -hmm. something bigger that they've been working on. Or maybe this is so brand new to them. It changes and alters the whole perspective. Even if they get it just the people who I have met and had an opportunity the people who really think channeling is either ridiculous or evil or bad, even to those people, I give them a great experience to be able to laugh or to be able to give them something to be frustrated about when they need that. So either way, uh, doing this with you makes me feel good that me and you are going to be a huge part of a lot of people's lives. Wow. That's awesome. (laughs) I completely agree. Oh. I completely agree. I want to ask you about one more thing. Okay. So um, are you now one of the things that I've been hearing a lot of lately, and I know that the first that, well, the raw consciousness has been coming into humanity over and over through a long period of time, obviously. Um, but I'm hearing more references to it over this last few months. And I know I'm strongly connecting into that. Have you been getting tapped by that raw consciousness and uh, and if so how has it how has it been connecting with you absolutely great question um Ra, to me is a representation of many things it's a representation of a collective consciousness who worked with the egyptians it's a collective group of entities 
who've exclusively worked with the earth. It's a part of what a lot of people label Christ consciousness. It can be one or two beings. So the raw energy to me is more of a blanket term for a lot of different things that humans try to understand in their primitive version or people really understood really well and only could describe it with that word, which we then lost track of meaning or, or whatever the case might be. So all of those things together, um, Ra means something different, I think, for almost each person than it will for another. But when it comes down to it, that energy itself is a sound vibration that sound vibration is a part of the sounds of creation. And the sounds of creation are fundamentally, um, when you look down into the submolecular structures and then the subatomic structures, sound vibration creates that. So this raw energy to me means more so than anything, the capability or part of the creation of the physical existence and in that there are so many different realms i have bumped into entities who i've channeled who have come through as ra or some version of ra uh, for instance there was one called alatara there was one called rata there was one called nira so all of them pull this fundamental energy and are different aspects of the ra energy and i've worked with those beings and those beings end up being uh, very energetically sound beings, very knowledgeable beings. And from my experience, uh, the Ra's that I've been able to kind of connect with and pull in have either been extremely oriented in knowledge base, uh, knowledge, scientific, things like that, or they've been extremely connected to the emotional base. There's not a great mixture of two. When you see art if you see wisdom when you see treb you see love or at least most people that's how they perceive i'm able to see both in both mm -hmm. because i've worked with them and experience but in these energies the times that i have worked with them i can only see one either mm -hmm. an extraordinary connection to emotional energy and heart center or the throat chakra and the wisdom base so it's very it's very unique energy for me. Um, even though I've worked with those types of beings who've come through as emotionless or very high emotionally, um, I can still always feel a little bit of, of either of the other energy that they're not able to express through my physical being. But with that being said, those raw energies just have polarity in them. And I don't know if it's my own connection to to connecting to them or if it's actually that's the way they're represented. But um, that's my experience with them at least. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I love the way you put that. I, I, I couldn't agree more with um, you, how you define the raw consciousness having being so undefinable really, and that it being <laughs> this tone, um, this ultimately a tonal consciousness essentially. Um, I, I have found that everything that I've explored thus far has led me to understanding this, the importance of understanding tone and frequency and sound and how everything is, is this and that that in and of itself is consciousness. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. One thing that popped in my mind as you were talking about that also, um, uh, recently I've, uh, I've been more curious about understanding our religious, um, our religious perceptions around our history, you know, looking at the stories um, as uh, just purely as stories of our history, because I've been really blocked. Um, you had mentioned earlier when you first started channeling that you couldn't listen to a lot of channelers and you couldn't really hear a lot of that because you needed your channel to be pure and you only could listen enough to get confirmation. And that has been, exactly my experience people are usually like have you read this person or have you heard about this person and i'm like i'm sorry i have no idea well but you're talking about what they're talking about i'm like well that's great confirmation thank you yeah. <laughs> we're on the same channel sweet i'm i'm tuning in <laughs> but i can't uh, i have been so heavily guarded and protected um, as from external influence of my consciousness, of my language, of my awareness, of my understanding, that I, it's almost like I haven't been able to read a complete book in about five years. I 
pick them up. And as soon as I start to read, I, I'll only pick out a few words that stick. And by the time I've gotten those words in my head, the book is gone and I have most of the knowledge the book had, but I can't actually read it. And it's not in the language of the author, you know? So, um, I, I was thinking as I was, I've recently resolved a lot of issues that blocked me from any sort of uh, religious experiences because of my own history. Uh, and I've been curious suddenly. So I started reading the Bible and reading the Quran. And one aspect in the Quran, it references, it says that the children of Israel are, um, uh, that they're not, that the pharaohs are not of the of creation they're separate from creation they're not of creation the children of israel are and i was I, i've been studying the quran with this islamic scholar and i asked him about it i was like why does it reference here and it says that the pharaohs are not from creation what does that mean but his language and my language through the barriers he was like i can't put that into words <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh! <laughs> so when you said that the raw consciousness comes in and that it's kind of, that there's a part of it that's outside of, uh, that really rings, that, that resonated with all these other little pieces that are like ping, ping, ping. Of, there are these other creations coming in and influencing each other, you know, we, and we don't talk enough about that at all. Well, absolutely. And it makes sense to experience what we most people have to experience the parts within creation before they go out to that feeling that of non-creation and, and external mm -hmm. experience and when you were talking to me too um, about having looked into channel information and then just you know just dropped it completely or at least only come into it when you need I, I have an experience the one where I shared where I just kind of cut it out. And then I have an experience where I said, you know what? I need to start being able to work with other channelers. <laughs> I will not work with another channeler energetically if I don't resonate with their energy as a person and some of the material. I don't have to agree with everything, but it has to be that that's not limiting people, things of that nature. So then I started exploring and it gave me reference. It gave me some new vocabulary. Um, it gave me some of those things. And then I found myself naturally not listening again. And it wasn't because I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. It was just because there was no energy in the other works that I wasn't either exploring for myself or it wasn't the right time to explore it. It's funny when you said, you know, hey, if someone handed you a book and said, um, you know, who's that? What's that? It's mm -hmm. funny because when Kalina and me first started a relationship, she would go through and say, yeah, this really great book. And I'm like, who? And she's like, Are you <laughs> me? and then she got to a point where she talked about Esther Hicks. Uh -huh. And I said, who? And she goes, Rob, are you kidding me? And I'm like, what? And, and she goes through and shows me. And then all of a sudden I'm looking and everyone I know knows who this is. I mean, literally, before I really started looking into other channeling, I only knew of Jane Roberts, uh, Lee Carroll, and Daryl Anka, and that was it. That's the mm -hmm. only channelers I knew existed on the planet, well, besides uh, K uh, Edgar Casey. But right. uh, all of those things, I found that when I let go of that energy within me that said I can't look because it will kind of taint my energy, then it did give me an opportunity to create relationships with people, not just on a professional level either. A mm -hmm. lot of these channelers that you see me work with now mm -hmm. are really good friends of mine now and, and people who I've spent time and energy with. So I think um, a lot of people say, I don't want to listen to other channelers, I want to listen to as much. Just like anything else, there's really no wrong way. And mm -hmm. I know I deviated that from your original question, yeah. which I apologize for, but uh, I had to, to mark that in my own mind. Yeah. Um, the raw consciousness too, back to that, it's a lot like Christ consciousness. It's mm -hmm. a lot like the words Pleiadian, Octorian, Syrian. Mm -hmm. When I say the word Pleiadian, I'm literally speaking of thousands of different races that I either have lived or do live mm -hmm. on one of many harmonic levels one of many dimensions or densities, one mm -hmm. on many of the planets around the, the 
th hundreds, thousands of stars that are there in the Pleiades. So all of those things together, when I say Pleiadian, it represents that large group. But when I say the fifth dimensional Pleiadian humanoids from Alcyon with the uh, two-tailed cats, <laughs> then I'm talking specifically about that. And I think a lot of people do that with Ra. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people do that with Christ consciousness. And I think a lot of people do that with a lot of collectives. A lot of people uh, put Archangel energy into that too. They'll talk about mm -hmm. um, Archangel energy as one whole, but there's a lot of different energies right. in there. There's the individual, there's the collective, there's even Metatron, as I've channeled him, he said there's 13 aspects of Metatron. Mm -hmm. That means there are 12 different uh, parts of his energy that talks about different categories or different uh, concepts and whole and mm -hmm. then when you smoosh them all together it's the 13th aspect so consciousness although it fractalizes although we experience it in fractals and parts and pieces energy is consistently moving it is never finite it always connects to something else so that's one thing I really you know, want to explain to people too, they're going through a lot of this information and energy with a right and wrong energy, uh, left or right energy, black or white. But some things are not just some things. Some things are everything. When you look at something, you don't have to say, well, these beings from here are this way and that's all there is because those beings don't just exist in that planet you're looking at. They don't just exist in your time period. They exist throughout probable realities, through infinite amounts of dimensions, uh, densities, and all of these things. And, and to, we have to define things as a human because we need a reference point. But outside of the language barrier of that, I think it's important for us to try to open ourselves up as much as we can to the larger experience at hand. So when we talk about integrating Pleiadian energy, mm -hmm. let's not just talk about those really friendly, long blonde hair cat. Let's talk yeah. about all the avians, all the um, reptilians, all of the insectoids, the every kind of being that's there. Just know that it's fluid. Know that it's not just one thing. No, that consciousness doesn't stop at one point. It always goes. I think that's very important for us to explore when we talk about extraterrestrials and collective consciousnesses. I could not agree more. That's awesome. <laughs> exactly. Perfectly on point. It feels to me. It's perfectly <laughs> resonant with what I under my understanding and my awareness of that. Oh. Thank you. You're welcome. Man, I could just keep talking to you forever. <laughs> I, I knew that would fun. happen. <laughs> it's been amazing and it's been fun. Oh, yes, it has. Thank you so very much for joining me. Here's another picture of Rob and um, and also, uh, oh my God, my brain just totally shut down, but I interviewed the other guy in the picture with you, Adro he, he channels Adronis, yeah, Brad. Brad Johnson. Brad. That's yes. my friend I was talking about earlier, mm -hmm. a guy who was literally the first other channeler I ever met <laughs> online. Uh -huh. and, um, really good friend. We've been friends for probably about six years now. That's awesome. You know, what's funny is he's the first person I ever actually interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> he's an amazing interviewer, interviewee, and teacher, and Adronis is amazing. Yeah, it was such a pleasure and just as much of a pleasure to work with you. I When I saw this picture, I was like, oh, I have to put that in. <laughs> and who is the woman in the middle? Um, right now, I can't see the picture. I, I can only see Brad because our faces are aligned on the left side of it. Oh, no worries. It's a woman who has red and gray hair and she's... Um, <gasps> I believe that's Roxanne, who uh, is also a channeler. Uh, Roxanne Swainhart, if it's who I'm thinking of, and I think it is. Uh, she was at the channel panel in the capacity of uh, being there to watch us. Uh, uh, but we've worked with her before. Uh, she's an amazing, amazing lady. And her channelings are out there, too, to, to look at and to check out. Uh, her name's Roxanne Swainhart. Awesome. I'm going to have to check her out because this picture resonated strongly for me. I was like, ooh. 
I want to know the, the, all three of them. <laughs> well, there's actually many events uh, out there. One recently um, was an event with myself, Brad Johnson, Roxanne Swainhart, oh my gosh. and a woman named Susie Byler. And we just did that. It was one that Brad Johnson created, and it was called The Channeling Nexus. And it's all four of us uh, channeling on one uh, like six hour event online. Oh, my, amazing. God. oh yeah. my God. I, I, I just can't even describe what I'm feeling as you describe it. <laughs> oh, that feels awesome. Aww. Oh, that feels awesome. That must have been an amazing event. Well, what do you have coming up? Do you have anything coming up? Yeah, um, we have the channel panel this year. We're not doing a live one. At least one's not planned this year. Uh, just do my father passed last October. He, he, oh. he was sick as soon as I got back from the last channel panel. Mm -hmm. And my dad was so close to me. So he died in October and it kind of shut me down from work for a couple months. And then as it got closer to the beginning of the year, all of our, all of our stuff got shifted over a couple of months. Like our last event we did in uh, just last weekend, we were supposed to be doing in April, but it got mm. moved to June. So this year we're doing an online channel panel. Mm. The uh, presenters aren't named yet. We know that we're going to get John Callie, who was, uh, channeler of spirit who was in the documentary of tuning in mm -hmm. Daryl and all the other guys. And then, uh, probably Brad Johnson will be there too. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're going to have at least 10 to 14 channelers. It's going to be a two day online event and it's going to be accessible for anyone in the world who has a computer or a smartphone that's connected to the internet. So we're going to be advertising that, we will have very specific details, I would imagine, the next two weeks, as, as well as more presenters that will be there. But me and Kalina, in the last two years, have networked ourselves with a lot of channelers. So every time we do a multi-channeler event, which the channel panel is our multi-channeler event uh, for the most part, we always bring really big people, really big names, but more than the bigness of their names, the resonance of their energy, we always work with people in the same alignment of energy that we work with. So that's why it's exciting to us, you know? That's we also awesome. do our events every first Wednesday of the month. I have uh, a radio show called the Enlightenment Evolution Hour, which is now um, a YouTube show where you can type in your questions, and that's the first Wednesday of each month at 9 p.m., and then, you know, just my normal one-on-one -on -one classes and, and teaching channeling and channeling sessions, things like that. Awesome. That's Absolutely. awesome. And they can find information about all of that on your website at etwhisper.com yeah. and it, on your Facebook channel or page. Yeah. Yeah, and YouTube, uh, I've got something everywhere. In fact, on Facebook, we got tons, uh, tons of different pages. If you type in Rob Gothier, it will pretty much take you to all the pages we have. We've got one for Metatron, if you only like him. One for Art, if you like him. Treb. We even got one for the Nihal Collective. I got one for myself, and one for the ET Whisper all together. So it's really, we put ourselves out a lot of different places so that you can take the part of our energy you like and, and connect with that yourself. Well, I hadn't even heard of the Nihal Collective until you've just been referencing it, so I'll, you can bet that I'm going to be checking that out. <laughs> and to your surprise, the last one was probably about uh, maybe around a year ago. There's going to be a new one released in the next uh, couple of weeks, and there was also one that was at the Asheville event, and we'll probably release that in full or snippets of that very soon. Oh, well, thank you so much for joining me, Rob, and for sharing so much of your story and yourself and your energy. I knew I was going to enjoy this with so much of my being, and thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for, for having me be here with you and for co-creating this. It was a very wonderful experience, and I love your energy. You're a wonderful person. Thank oh. you so much. Thank you. I feel the same. It's so great. I, 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 what, my favorite thing about the evolution is that as we resonate more strongly with ourselves, 
we uh, draw more people that resonate strongly with us. <laughs> so then, well, we always do that, but we enjoy it more. <laughs> That's absolutely perfect. Dead on. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Tales from the Path. And um, remember, your story is, is there so you can help other people because if we don't hear each other's stories, we feel alone, we feel isolated, and we feel like something is wrong with us. And, and when we hear each other tell each other's stories, we go, oh, I'm not, I'm not alone. I'm a part of this. We're all a part of this. So um, on that note, have a great day and we'll talk to you. We'll talk to you soon. Beautiful. One second.